significant scientific discoveries of the 20th century, for which her thesis advisor was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1974. She was the first person to discover radio pulsars. She became the president of the Royal Astronomical Society in 2002, the first female president of the Institute of Physics in 2008, and the first female president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh in 2014. She is one of the most powerful women in the UK, a strong supporter of women in physics, empowering women and serving as a remarkable role model. She's Jocelyn Bell Burnell. So can you see my, can you see my screen? Yeah. Brilliant, thank you very much. So, Thank you for your staying power and being here at the end of quite a strenuous meeting, I dare say. I hope you found it useful as well as interesting. I'm going to talk about women in astrophysics around the world, um, simply because there is data on this. There is not the equivalent data for women in physics. There's a body called the International Astronomical Union. And let me just deal with this. Okay. There's a body called the International Astronomical Union that for a number of years now has been collecting data on women in astrophysics. I'm also going to say a little bit about the Athena Swan scheme, uh, which you may or may not find interesting. So the International Astronomical Union, or the um, was approached in 1990 about the position of women in astrophysics around the world. And the then secretary of the IAU, sorry, Derek McNally, Derek McNally didn't want to have anything to do with this. So it's, he said he saw the uh, status of women in astronomy as essentially a social issue, and the International Astronomical Union was about astronomy and not social matters. So we got a bit of a rebuff at that point. Fast forward um, to the late 1990s and the equivalent person, the general secretary, was Johannes Andersen, a man from Denmark, an astronomer from Denmark. His wife is also an astronomer, and she was having a lot of trouble getting a job, getting a decent job, whereas he wasn't. And he wondered if this was a gender issue. And he realized he had the ability to answer that question himself, because as general secretary of the IAU, he had access to all the membership data, both the country's membership and what we call the individual membership. So the IAU is unusual in that not only uh, astron major astronomy bodies in each country are members, but they have a number of individuals who are members as well. Unfortunately, physics only has countries as members, not individuals and maths only has countries as members, not individuals, which is why I can't do the same analysis for physics or for maths. So Johannes started recording the IAU individual membership data segregated by gender. And that's now been going on for 20 something years. And it's a very interesting database. And it's that database that I have been Thundering. So I'm going to say a bit about women in astronomy today worldwide, as indicated by the IAU's database. Um, the IAU now has 14,000 members. There's both individual membership and junior membership. Junior membership also being individual, but also junior. The data is recorded by the country where you work and by gender. Um, the individual and the junior categories are frequently merged. 
um, but they also have data on the age. And interesting, of the 14,000, only four people refused to specify whether they were female or male. Um, these days, you'd have to have more dimensions as well, but this, of course, is going back fully 20 years. So looking at the data, I've looked at countries which have more than 20, sorry, 200 individual astronomers in membership so that the root N errors are reasonably small. And I've worked out the percentage female for each of these countries. And there's about a dozen of them. Italy is best, 28%, France, 26 Brazil, 23 Spain, 22 Russia, 21 The world average is 19%. The Netherlands comes in at the world average. And below the world average is Australia, USA, Canada, India, China, Germany, UK, and Japan is one of the lowest. Um, the Japanese result is not surprising given the attitudes there have been there to women. It's disappointing to see the UK so low. It used to be higher up. Um, USA contributes about a quarter of all the membership. So it's quite clever of the USA to be below the world average. It's going to pull the world average towards itself. But even so, it comes out lower. The English speaking countries are all below the world average. Southern European countries are high. Um, South America, Central America often does quite well. Russia has an interesting history for women working in that it lost a lot of its men through two world wars and a major flu epidemic. And the women have had to go out to work for at least 80, 90 years. And the state provides a lot of childcare facilities. So that's probably why Russian Federation is so high. As I say, physics or maths don't have the same database, but talking to the, the physicists, the International, um, International Physics Union, I think it is, anyway, Talking to the physics body, um, they say that they see a similar sort of pattern in the physics data, they believe. Now, there are some effects that might come into play. One is you have to be nominated by your country's profession to become a member. And so this is usually done by the professional body in the country. In the UK, this would be the Royal Astronomical Society. But often these professional bodies are male dominated. So there may well be some kind of filter there. The data is publicly available if you want to go plunder it yourself. And this is the website where you find it. So as I've said, Southern Europe, Latin America have higher percentage. Northern Europe and the English speaking countries have lower percentages. And I don't believe the brains are particular markedly different in different parts of the world. So I think this is something to do with culture in the different countries, not the women's brains. And as I've already said, there's believed to be a similar distribution for physics and for maths. So it looks to me quite likely that there are cultural factors at work. Um, one very obvious one is that the men may be in other subjects which are seen as more prestigious than astronomy. In some countries, you know, engineering is considered the most prestigious and the men will tend to be there. If you live in a country where you still live quite close to your parents, and if you have children, your parents may be able to help with the child minding, which would release you to go and be an astronomer. Or you may live in a country where there's great disparity of income. And there'll be lots of poor women who would only be too happy to go, come into your house, be your housekeeper, your childminder, your laundry maid, your cook, your everything, while you go off and be an astronomer. So probably cultural factors play quite a big part in this distribution. I've been watching this data for a number of years, and since 2016, there have been some changes. 
Here I'm looking at countries with more than 100 members, just so we bring more countries into the uh, picture. The world average has risen from 17% to 19%, so that's rising half a percent a year. That's not exactly rushing it. Don't work out when we reach parity, it's too depressing. Um, but a complication is that in this particular interval, um, junior membership was introduced, and this has probably led to a jump in female membership. Uh, I'll show you shortly that there's quite a lot of young women now in the IAU. I've looked at countries which have changed remarkably during that four years. The Netherlands has nearly doubled its percentage female. Chile has gone up by 6%. India has gone up by 5%. Belgium, Germany, Italy, Mexico, South Korea, USA have all risen by 3%. Britain has not moved at all, which actually means it's dropped down the table, which is really very disappointing. I asked colleagues in, sorry, I'm having trouble, asked colleagues in the Netherlands what had happened that they had this remarkable increase. And they said for a limited time, they were allowed to appoint women only to uh, faculty positions. Uh, we wouldn't be allowed to do that in Britain. Um, whether we might be allowed to do it temporarily sometime, I wouldn't like to bet. But the Dutch people thought that probably contributed, contributed a lot to their rise. And I know that in India, there's been a campaign to increase the number of IAU members. And the women involved in that campaign have made a particular point of nominating women. So the numbers can be improved if there's a will. So the age distribution. I seem to have lost my pointer. That's a nuisance. Let's click on the pointer again. Oh. Um, we can see the mouse, so it's OK. All right. Um, I am on this slide. But I do have a pointer. Right. So age in 10 year gaps, the number of women in each age group, the number of men in each age group, and the ratio men to women. And the number of women peak in here, a little bit above this, so lower 40s. The number of men peak in the higher 50s. It looks like two separate populations, doesn't it? I wonder if this is to do with the junior membership in part, bringing in a lot of young women, could be. The male to female ratio is interesting. It rises steadily. When we get to this senior age range, it's quite markedly 220 men to 20 women. And that's in spite of the fact that it is the women that tend to live longer than the men. So these ones um, are probably better preserved than those ones. But because of the historic dominance of men, um, this ratio is very large. It's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. And I do worry a bit about the effect of coronavirus on the work and the promotion prospects of women, married women who have domestic responsibilities, perhaps more than their male counterparts. We will see. So turning to UK universities, and I want to say a little bit about the road to equality in UK universities. For quite a long time, we've been collecting data on how many women and how many men there are at each level. It shows that women are in a minority and the minority gets smaller, the higher the level. It also shows that women progress more slowly than their male counterparts. Maybe they present less confidently. Maybe it's unconscious bias. It also shows that women put in fewer grant applications, are less willing to apply for jobs. If their grant application is turned down, they wait longer before reapplying, and they put in grant applications for smaller 
numbers, smaller uh, funding, smaller amount of money. So it does look a little bit as if there's a funding system that favours the brave or the brash. Um, this data was of considerable concern. And so it was realised that the women needed fixing. That's what was said. We need to make women braver, more willing to put in grant applications, to apply for promotion, to apply for jobs. And there were special training courses for women to help them write better grant applications and to build their courage to remedy these deficiencies. And whilst that was some help, it contained a gross assumption. The assumption was that the problem was with the women, that there was absolutely no problem, thank you, with the way science and scientific society was organised. It was the fault of the women, which we we're now a bit more intelligent and a bit more subtle about these things. Slightly more intelligent and slightly more subtle. Uh, some special fellowships were set up for women, returner fellowships for women coming back after a career break. And there was talk of other things open to women only. And then it came to light that some of the women holding these things were told by some of their charming male colleagues you only got that position because you're a woman. You're not up to the standard of the rest of the department. You should leave. That was actually said to some of the women holding these women only funding positions. So increasingly, these types of funding are open to both men and women, but they do fund a lot of women. And then gradually, the funding agencies, the research councils and people like that, began to realize that funding individual women helps the women, but doesn't actually change anything, doesn't change society in the long run. And they began to look for what we call institutional change, making a place more friendly for all, more fair for all, not just for women. And I want to stress that organizations can be sexist, even though all the individuals that work in that organization are not sexist. Structures of inst institutional structures can be sexist. There can be possible biases in recruitment, retention, and so on. There can be unawareness of different management styles, um, and there can be what's called unconscious bias. And my favorite example of unconscious bias is given here below. I dare say you've had to fill out a form which asked which sex you were. And maybe you've got the option of several boxes, M, F, other, prefer not to say. Look at the order these boxes come in. Why does M come before F? It's not alphabetical order. It's unconscious bias. There's a similar thing if you're uh, seeking information on black and minority ethnic. The boxes might well start white, black, and several other more subtle ones. Why does white come before black? It's not alphabetical order. So these are examples of unconscious bias. And there's still a lot of it around, and it sends messages to our unconscious, unconsciousness. I haven't got that word quite right, but you know what I mean. Sends messages to our brains that we don't often fully notice, but do get themselves embedded and, and create a climate. You may get to hear a bit about Athena Swan, and I want to tell you just a little bit about this UK initiative. Um, this is going back probably about 20 years. Yeah, maybe even more than that. A small group of senior women scientists met from time to time to try and work out what on earth we could do to make the situation of women in science better. And these are the ones I could find photographs of. So there's Julia Higgins, top left, Wendy Hall, Southampton University, um, Jill Samuels, who is in industry, 
Caroline Fox, who wasn't actually um, a university employee, myself, Nancy Lane. And we would meet from time to time in a borrowed room and try and work out what we could do to improve the situation. And then Caroline, who's a bit of a psychologist, said, you know, if we create a prize for the most women-friendly university, all the vice chancellors, they're male, will compete for that prize. At that stage, all the vice chancellors were male. We thought this was a brilliant idea, but we were poor. We could afford a glass rose bowl. So we announced this competition prize, a glass rose bowl. I think it was engraved glass rose bowl for the university that demonstrated that it was fair to women, particularly for women in the sciences. And Caroline was right, they competed. Not so many the first time round, but a reasonable number. And we awarded the prize. We did it for several years in a row. And each time the number of people, number of universities competing got bigger and bigger. And we ended up putting together the best ideas we had from all those university submissions. And there were two main universities that provided the best data. One had a scheme called Athena, and one had a scheme called Scientific Women's Academic Network. And so the scheme we labelled as Athena Swan. And it grew and it grew, not terribly fast, until one day the Chief Medical Officer for Health for England and Wales, Dame Sally Davis, was meeting with the heads of physics department, physics, medical department, sorry, in, from UK universities. And they had the kind of meeting that heads of departments have with funding bodies, you know, talking about how the funding's handed out and what requirements are and so on. And at the end of the meeting, Dame Sally Davis said to all the gathered heads of medical schools, you're all men, where are the women? Oh, it doesn't matter, they said. And she had, as she put it, a rush of blood to the head and said, if you want to apply for my funding, you have to hold Athena Swan bronze by this time next year. And once a funding body requires that kind of thing, people pay attention because research funding is very, very important. She forgot to tell Athena Swan, and we were puzzled by the sudden rush of applications from medical schools, but we got it sorted out. And that was the start. And then more research funding bodies joined in. And it became science and maths and medicine. And then it expanded to arts and social sciences, where the question is not where are the women, the question is where are the men? So it became about gender equality across universities. And then it spread to Ireland and to Australia and to Canada. And now it's coming in in the USA, but it's also linked with diversity, particularly racial diversity, and it's known as sea change. So it has really gone places and I'm very, very proud of it. Um, once the funding bodies got their hands on it, they, they thought it was a good idea to add a few more questions and they wanted more information. And the thing grew a bit like topsy and, and got somewhat top heavy as well, which is, a, which is a shame. But it's made a big, big change, not all of it intended, but it's made a big, big change um, in universities. So I am really very proud of it. Going back to women in astrophysics, and we see that there are more women in astrophysics than there used to be. We are enabling more women to climb up the ranks, to climb up through the, the, academic, climb up the academic ladder, or a bit like Ivy climbing up a wall to climb up. But the Ivy doesn't change the wall. The ivy clings to the wall, but doesn't much change it. 
in the case of women climbing up the ranks in academia, is the structure underneath changing? I think it is a bit, but I think that needs watching. And finally, some um, quotes from elsewhere just to entertain you. Um, in 1930, the Earl of Birkenhead was fool enough to make predictions about the world 100 years hence. Don't do this, folks. You'll get it wrong like this. In 2030, women will still, by their wit and charm, inspire the most able men towards heights that they themselves could never achieve. And in the USA in 1946, 65% of people thought men were smarter than women, but by 2018, 86% thought men and women were equally smart. So there is some progress and it is getting better all the time. I wouldn't claim it is a quality yet. But once again, the IAU is, has been providing leadership. Uh, for the last three years, it's had its first female president and its first female general secretary. The woman on the right, Evine van Dieshoek from the Netherlands, has been the first female president, and Teresa Lago from Portugal on the left, the first female general secretary. So change is happening, but not terribly fast. Thank you for your interest and your attention, and I will stop there. Thank you, Jocelyn, and thank you so much for everything you've done for, for all of us. I'll, I'll share the question that we have for you. I hope you can see them. Where's, ah, right, here we go. Yep. I'll, I'll start reading the ones that have the most likes and then I'll make them disappear. <laughs> so what could we as undergraduates do to combat gender inequality? Uh, you're not in a very powerful position, so you have to be a bit careful, um, but you could call out your male colleagues gently if you think they're being gender biased, you know, do you think that remark was fair or fair to women kind of thing? Um, there have also been examples where um, student homework has been marked differently for men and for women. Um, and if you have a friendly guy who's got a different mark and said exactly the same as you have, he's usually got a higher mark than you have, the pair of you could go and ask the person who was marking your work. Um, this is particularly good if it's something like a piece of coding for homework and you've done identical coding. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> but, you know, your, your lecturers aren't malicious, but they may not be that thoughtful or that well educated in gender issues, to be honest. So I think gently calling out some examples of inequality. Don't do them all. There will be a lot. Don't do them all or people will stop listening to you. Choose your battles carefully. Okay. Um, what would you recommend for putting, would you recommend putting prefer not to answer for gender questions in order to avoid issues like unconscious bias? It a little bit depends on um, what we're talking about. I mean, if it's your tutor marking your work, he knows fine well you're female. Um, so it would only be used in a situation where the lecturer doesn't know you that well and you're not giving a name that clearly indicates a gender. Jocelyn's quite a good name because it's male and female. It's at least in this country. <laughs> but I haven't thought of doing that, I must admit. But yeah, it might be worth a try. 
controlled experiment. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. By the way, many people think that I'm I'm male before they meet me, but for me, my name is really female, uh, at least in Bulgarian, it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there seems to be a lot less representation of women in astronomy careers compared to at undergraduate. Do you think that women feel discouraged from pursuing astrophysics, PhD and research? I would say there's an even smaller representation of women in physics careers. Um, I think astronomy does slightly better than physics, to be honest. Um, but speaking more generally, do women feel discouraged from pursuing PhDs? Um, I don't think so. Certainly in Oxford, we get a fair number of female applications. And I would have thought it was as high as in the undergraduate body. Um, that sounds good. Mm. Next question is, do they get admitted in the same ratio? <laughs> question. <laughs> well, we saw Danielle's presentation about the difference it makes when you just change the name and the application is the same. So we know we know the answer to that one already, mm. unfortunately. Mm. So um, could you have disputed the Nobel Award issue or would it not change anything? No, you can't dispute the Nobel Award. Um, and criticizing it actually makes you, gets you the label, you're a bad loser, that kind of thing. Um, there was some fracas around a recent Nobel Prize, um, the, the Nobel Prize for the black hole in the center of galaxies. And Genzel, I think, thought he should have had it on his own and criticized that he was sharing it with somebody. And it did him no good at all. But you can't actually protest it. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I guess we shouldn't talk about things like that. Um, do you think that the current government's attitude to secondary education is going to have a knock on effect on the uptake by women going to the university? I wonder what the question's talking about. Is it the way that exam grades are? Yeah, I believe so. Right, yes. Um, I think it's, it's probably going to affect both genders, to be honest. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily affect women more than men. But I'm not absolutely sure, to be honest. I guess it might depend on whether they have children or not, especially if they're mature students. Yes. Then the next question is, in terms of grants, do you think that the old boys network was at play? Male academics more likely to suggest grants to other male colleagues? That may have been a factor, yes. Um, increasingly grant awarding bodies are moving to what's called double blind. So when you put in an application, your application is sent to somebody with some expertise in the field uh, and they're asked to comment on it. You know, is it a good idea? Have you asked for too much money? Have you got enough people, not enough people? Blah, 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 blah. And um, Hubble Space Telescope pioneered this. And it, the way it works is the applicant doesn't know who the referees are and the referees don't know who the applicant is. So you have to write your proposal in a way that doesn't reveal who you are. And this has markedly increased the number of women getting awards, really markedly. So that's really interesting. So that's a good strategy. It's not like the strategy where you um, use AI and they only use, and they only accept male candidates. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, what inspired you to study astrophysics? It turned out that I was good at physics. Um, I nearly didn't get to do physics because at the time I was entering secondary schools, everybody knew, beware of everybody knew, 
but everybody knew that girls were only going to get married and be housewives. And it was the boys who were going to have careers. The boys needed the science education. The girls needed to learn how to cook. So without offering choice, they sent girls to the cookery room and the boys to the science lab. And um, I had been promised by my parents I'd get to do science. And um, I was very upset and told my parents and they hit the roof, phoned the head teacher, as did the local doctor um, who had a daughter in the class, as did one other set of parents. And when the science class next met, it had three girls and all the boys. And I think we were the first girls that teacher had ever taught. He clearly considered us dynamite. We had to sit right up at the front <laughs> against his desk, you know, that close. We did physics the first term and I came top of the class. Um, so I felt vindicated and I think my parents felt vindicated. And I continued good at physics. Chemistry was okay. Biology was boring. And as I went through secondary school, um, I was wondering what kind of physics I would do. I would probably do a physics degree and then what would I do? And my father brought some astronomy books home from the public library. And one of them was by Fred Hoyle, who was a very good author. And at school at just that point, we were doing motion in a circle. And I borrowed dad's library book and I'm reading through Fred Hoyle. And he's talking about the rotation of galaxies. And I realized that the physics I'm learning in school can be applied to these great massive systems of stars. I thought, right, I'll be in a star. <laughs> I refined that to be a radio astronomer because radio astronomers work daytime. Optical astronomers only work at night and that's tough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now we have a very long question. Um, I have noticed that a lot of the high-flying successful women in physics went to private school or girls' school. What about the girls who haven't had that chance? I feel really daunted by the fact that I'm not only a woman, but also a state-educated girl from a much less affluent area of Britain and who cannot say that they've had the opportunities and the same um, cultural standing in society. Girls' schools aren't necessarily good for science. Um, we had a very good physics teacher um, in, for most of my secondary education. He'd come out of retirement a second time to teach us. Um, sorry, I should go back a bit. I went to a girls' school from age 13, having given up on the local <laughs> state school. <laughs> um, our chemistry teacher... I think he didn't know about the periodic table. We would ask him questions about why does this combine with that? And he'd say, God made it so. And since we were at a church school, it was a bit hard to argue with. <laughs> <laughs> so girls schools actually don't always have good science teaching. Um, so the point in general is a good one, um, but don't assume that private schools Necessary for girls necessarily deliver the best education. Um, but I think it's more about the confidence that maybe comes. Um, and if you're going to do research in physics, you need to be brave. I'm sorry, you need courage. You need more courage than your male colleagues because you're in a minority, really. Um, so I think it's to do with personal determination, stubbornness, courage. I want to do this. I'm going to do my best to do it and stuff them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and show them that they're not smarter than us. <laughs> Always. I mean, they can be sometimes. <laughs> yeah. um, is being a mother harder to manage when you're a scientist? compared to other career paths? Um, possibly marginally, because you may need to be in a lab, whereas other things you can maybe carry on at home rather better while you're looking after a sick kid or something. Um, 
but it, it's it's not easy combining children and a career. Um, it's getting better because there are more childminding facilities, but there aren't enough and they cost a bomb. Um, so it, it is difficult um, in that sense. It's doable, but it's difficult. That's, that's not very encouraging, but it, it's nice that the situation is getting better. Um, oh, that's an interesting question. What were the two universities who had the Athena and Swan schemes? Wow, I'm not sure I can remember. Um, they weren't the sort of big prestigious ones. I know that. Um, they tended to be smaller and newer ones rather than the long established, but I'm afraid I can't now remember what they were. It's going back quite a long way. <laughs> <laughs> well then, <laughs> Let's look at the next question. Um, can you get into astrophysics even if you only did a general physics honours degree? Quite a lot of people don't have the chance to do any astrophysics as an undergraduate. So a good physics honours degree, fine, go for it. You might want to do a little bit of reading around to make sure you know what contemporary astrophysics is, but <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, you mentioned more applicants of the award once funding bodies had it as a requirement. Do you believe universities are more likely to strive for equality in general if there are financial incentives? Do you feel that this leads to people only making changes on the surface rather than institutional changes? Financial incentives are very, very powerful. Um, there's no escaping that, uh, what, whatever they concern, whatever they do, they're, they're extremely powerful. Um, if, the, um, if the incentive is well set up, then you can't do it with only superficial changes. But for instance, the Athena Swan has had some unintended consequences. Uh, an interview panel, you know, you're recruiting a new university lecturer, an interview panel has to have a reasonable number of women on it. There aren't that many women in your physics department. They're working quite hard. Um, and a number of postdoc, young postdoc women are saying they're getting a lot of interviews for jobs. And that's probably because a university has to say that they interviewed this number of women and this number of men, and there has to be a reasonable balance. So the relatively few women are getting called to lots of interviews, they're getting lots of interview experience, but sometimes they're only called to make up the numbers of women being interviewed. So there are sometimes unintended consequences. Yeah. It's, it's not nice to find out more and more about this. You know, when you live in the, uh, when you're oblivious, it's so much nicer. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask you a few more questions and then um, I'll ask people to move in together because I assume that that will be um, a nicer place to talk and, and ask questions. So what do you think needs to be done to help inspire more girls in GCSE and A-levels to pursue higher education in physics? Yeah, this is something that concerns the Institute of Physics quite a lot. Um, there have been various experiments. They've tried with some girls only classes at school. You know, the, all the girls are in one class, the boys are in another class. Because you can find that when student, school students are doing, well, school and university students are doing experiments, he's the one that's twiddling all the knobs and she's writing down the results. She's the secretary. He's the one doing the physics. I'm exaggerating slightly, but um, that kind of situation can, can happen. Um, uh, and you do need to look out for it, incidentally. And if you find it happening to you at any stage, you know, say, should we swap roles now? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's one kind of thing. So girls only sets, 
it's certainly well worth experimenting with. Um, and the girls only set has a rather different feel from a male only set. Okay, and I'll ask you just one more question. Do you have a favorite female scientist, uh, physicist? Uh, yes, uh, it's an astrophysicist um, who died fairly recently. Her name is Vera Rubin. And there's a big, big telescope in Chile building that's going to be named after her. The first telescope named for a woman. That is really, really nice. So I'll share the, the gather link in the chat and then I'll head it to Andy so that he can actually close the conference. Thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for answering your questions. My pleasure, Danny. Thank you.